Why hello you love little peppercorns, my name's Noah Lee, god of game criticism and lord of excellent taste, and today's subject, Graven, is a bit of a strange game that's been getting some seriously mixed reviews since its emergence from early access just a few weeks ago, one that's been praised by a few, ignored by many, and hated by some. A genre-defying first-person shooter that toes the line between two contrasting subgenres, confusing its players as to just what kind of game it actually is, and the kind of game that's more than ripe for an analysis from me, Game Critic Supreme. Let me take you back to the 90s for a second, because ultimately this is where our story begins. I'm sure you're now all more than familiar with the tale of the first-person shooter, which began life at id Software in 1992 with Wolfenstein 3D, though it wouldn't be until the following year's Doom when this new genre would really take off. After this, and thanks to the explosion of the Doom modding scene, first-person shooters began popping up left and right. These lovingly named Doom clones were all the rage in the PC market, to the point that even id themselves were keen to get in on the action, hoping to work with other developers to create a slew of of id sanctioned Doom clones to further corner the market. Around this time, John Romero, co-founder of id, stumbled upon a small team of promising developers from Madison, Wisconsin, called Raven Software, and the two studios would collaborate on a dark fantasy-themed Doom clone called Heretic. Heretic is still very much an FPS, running on a heavily modified version of id's Doom engine, but instead of guns, you fire magical projectiles from staves, fist weapons, and use spell books and potions to buff your damage output, as well as your defenses. While the medieval fantasy setting of the game was unique for the genre, at the time, it's the technical aspects of Heretic that make it most noteworthy, as it has the distinction of being one of the first FPSs, and probably the first within a 2D game engine, to allow the player to look up and down rather than just left and right, something that not even Doom 2 had managed despite the two games releasing within a couple months of each other. The following year, Heretic was followed up with a spiritual successor called Hexen Beyond Heretic, which added some light RPG elements to the dark fantasy FPS formula the previous game had pioneered, as well as eschewing the typical chapter and level-based progression FPSs were known for at the time, opting instead for a series of hub worlds with levels that branched off from them with more intricate and complex level design that allowed for more open-ended play rather than just always trying to find the next exit. Its direct sequel, Hexen 2 Beyonder Heretic, would take the series into the realm of 3D, running on an enhanced version of the Quake engine, further expanding upon the RPG elements and intricate level design of the previous game while delivering a darker, moodier atmosphere, the kind of which only early 3D graphics can provide. Which brings us to Graven, a game that not so subtly refers to itself as a spiritual successor to Hexen and its sequel, despite its developers having no connection with the previously mentioned games whatsoever. Graven is developed by Danish developer Slipgate Ironworks, formerly known as Interceptor Entertainment, who are best known for the 2013 Rise of the Triad reboot, 2016's top-down shooter Bombshell, as well as a whole host of ports and co-developed projects, all of which have received fairly mixed reviews. And Graven appears to be no exception. Looking into Slipgate's history prior to playing didn't instill a lot of confidence in me, especially when I watched the trailer for their retro-inspired 2.5D action platformer Rad Rogers, and who boy does that look like hot garbage. But I gotta say that trailer for Graven really hooked me, as it appeared from the few snippets of gameplay that this wasn't just another medieval-themed classic FPS, or <sighs> boomer shooter, as some are unfortunately calling them today but instead looked to be a slower paced and more thoughtful immersive sim along the lines of Deus Ex, or my personal favorite, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. And that might explain the slew of mixed reviews for this one, as historically immersive sims tend to be very confusing to players, as fans of FPSs are usually bored to tears by the slower paced action and frustrated by the need to play strategically and manage resources rather than just running in all guns ablazing, while fans of immersive sims are, uh, how do I put this delicately, picky as hell. I know, because I'm one of these people. So with all that in mind, I finally sat down to play, and after finishing it, uh, yeah, I can definitely see why this one's been having such a rough launch, though my overall take on Graven might surprise you. You play as a priest of the Orthogonal Order, now exiled after spilling the blood of a heretic from your church in an act of rage to save your adopted daughter from the fiend's twisted ritual. You now journey to the swampy town of Cruxforth, following a lead as to where your daughter may have been taken after this fateful event, if she's even still alive, and along the way you'll help those you meet by killing monsters, lifting curses, and combating local cult activity, trying to attain some level of redemption for your sins. The first thing that caught my attention about Graven was its unique aesthetic, which upon a first glance appears to be going for the low-poly, retro-inspired look that's so in vogue right now in the indie scene, but Graven opts for higher poly models and is typically used in this style, as well as varying texture resolutions that are scaled in proportion with the model they're mapped to, creating a heavily contrasting mix of high and low resolutions that somehow all fit together into a cohesive whole. If we take a close look at this guard here, for example, you can really see this effect in action. The texture of his face has small, tightly knit pixels that are almost indistinguishable from one another, while the texture of the chainmail around his neck and head is made up of large splotches 
ranges of easy to spot pixels with the rest of his armor, clothing, and skin having varying pixel resolutions that fall somewhere in between these two extremes with the environment behind him following suit. This has certainly been done before as if we take a look at something like Spyro 2 here you can see that the resolution of the texture on the floor has noticeable pixels while on the texture of Spyro himself they're practically invisible but this was done out of necessity due to hardware limitations and furthermore great care was taken in games of this era as well as modern games that are aping this look to make inconsistencies like this as inconspicuous as possible whereas Graven, a game running on modern hardware without these limitations chooses to highlight these varying texture resolutions delivering a striking aesthetic in the process. Now whether this was done intentionally or merely out of incompetence I can't say nor do I think it matters either way Graven has a look that's uniquely its own and it's an aspect that I don't feel has been given the proper credit it deserves. This holds true for the setting of the game as well. The first chapter takes place in and around the previously mentioned swampy town of Cruxfirth, a formerly grand city with a thirst for knowledge that attracted nobles and scholars from all over to its world-famous library, now decrepit and diseased from a cursed malady that causes people to go insane, and one that is almost certainly tied to the various cults of heretics that have strayed from the parallel path of the orthogonal order. Swamps usually aren't the most visually or tonally impressive settings in video games, as more often than not, if you've seen one swamp, you've seen them all, but but Graven's first chapter actually has a take on this trope of a swampy level that's a lot more carefully thought out than this type of setting usually is. In addition to its former glory as an intellectual center, Cruxforth was and remains a town whose economy is intricately tied to the collection and trading of peat, and this one little factoid colors much of the personality of this swampy world. However, unlike real peat, the peat of this world is much more volatile, closer to something like natural gas or dynamite, which is basically just an excuse for the game to have barrels of peat scattered about for you to shoot or throw at a group of enemies to blow them up, as well as your grenade launcher equivalent weapon which lobs globs of burning peat at your foes to create the same effect. The residents of Cruxforth and its surrounding lands use peat to power their technology, heat their homes, cook their food, and protect themselves, creating not just a medieval-themed magical world, but a vibe much closer to something like steampunk, or I guess in this case, peat punk. It's a really interesting setting, the likes of which I've never seen before, and I have to give credit where credit is due for turning what is usually one of the most boring video game settings into one of the most intriguing I've seen in a while. However, it is a bit of a shame that the unique theming that Graven works so hard to craft only holds true for the first third of the game, as chapters 2 and 3 swap out this unique swampy world for a snowy forest and a desert of ancient ruins, respectively, and while these settings aren't necessarily bland, they are much more generic than the swamplands of Cruxforth, and unlike in chapter 1, they don't play around with these concepts to make something new and interesting out of them either. They feel really half-assed in comparison, is what I'm saying. This kind of holds true for the level design as well, as chapter 1 feels far more more carefully thought out than chapters 2 and 3. When you first arrive at Cruxforth, you learn that the city gates have been shut and that one of the guards will only let you in once a clog in the local corpse slough has been cleared out, a segment of the game that more or less acts as the tutorial for you to quite literally get your feet wet. And this little segment of the game mirrors pretty much the rest of chapter 1 as being a small little sandbox for you to approach things in a handful of different ways by putting your magic weapons and puzzle solving skills to the test to proceed as well as find well hidden secrets reminiscent of those found in the classic FPS and immersive sims Graven is taking inspiration from. Once you finally make it into the city, you'll quickly realize that there are several different paths branching out from this hub which act as the levels of the game in a manner very similar to the original Hexen. And that's one of the more unique aspects of Graven, which is the way in which the game progresses. Unlike classic FPSs, it isn't level based in that you complete one level and then proceed to the next, and unlike most immersive sims, it doesn't have an overall linear progression with all the levels naturally blending into one another, but rather it has segments of its map that are isolated isolated in such a way that they ostensibly act as individual levels in the fact that you'll have to play them in a set order, but since they all exist in the same physical space, you can return to these areas at any time to stock up on supplies or find secrets you missed your first time around. In addition to Hexen, Graven's first act also reminds me of the early moments of the 2017 Prey reboot and the way in which you start in a central area with several branching paths that you explore and then backtrack through to return to this central area before going down another path, though that's pretty much where the similarities end because after a few hours of playing, I realized that, unlike Prey, this isn't an immersive sim like I thought it was. For those who may not be familiar with the term, immersive sims are less of a genre and more of a design methodology of giving the player a combination of in-game tools, level design, and scenarios, and then leaving it up to the player as to how best to tackle a given situation.
documentation, often in ways that developers never intended or even considered, though since there happens to be so much overlap among games designed with this philosophy in mind, calling it a genre is fine in my book. Immersive sims are usually in first person, they usually have some form of shooting mechanics, whether it be guns, magic, or medieval weaponry, and they must allow for more open-ended approaches to their design, even if their overall progression is linear. A typical immersive sim encounter might be something along the lines of there's a massive wooden gate that prevents you from proceeding, and it's up to you to figure out how to get past. Maybe you set the gate on fire and wait for it to burn. Maybe you use your grapple hook to climb over it. Maybe you break into the guardhouse and steal a key to a side door, or maybe you find another path entirely using one of your many other skills, tools, and abilities. Setups like this allow the player to make creative decisions and dictate how they want to approach solving conflicts in a way that makes you feel as though your choices really matter and that whether a choice is a good or a bad one is based on what tools and abilities you have at your disposal. And Graven has a little bit of this design methodology incorporated into it, but not enough for me to confidently call it an immersive sim. For example, there's one spot in chapter one where I needed to get this key up on this ledge, and I remembered that I could pick up and stack boxes, so I tried to do just that and climb my way up there, but quickly realized that the developers thought of that and only allowed you to stack boxes so high to prevent you from doing stuff like this. A true immersive sim would have just let me do it, but Graven actively discourages creative solutions like these unless it's something the developers themselves intend you to do. And everything is designed like this. There are little bits of level design that allow you to gain a better vantage point to fight enemies from, but then the developers will pair this vantage point with a far-off enemy that you can barely see which will blindside you if you dare to try and play smart. You can use your fire spell to burn certain wooden defenses so you can proceed, but other wooden defenses can only be opened by a switch or a trigger of some kind, while others can only be blown open with a barrel of peat, despite the fact that they're all constructed out of the same materials that you've set on fire in dozens of other areas. You can jump down from a high area to get into a spot that's behind a locked door, only to find that you're now trapped there because you didn't enter in the intended manner, and the game won't let you unlock the door from the opposite side, so you have to reset your game just to get out. You personally found two or three entrances to an area that the game has arbitrarily locked off until you find the one somehow even more hidden route that they intended, while puzzles that should require you to think carefully and find crucial information in order to solve are so convoluted and sloppily designed that it's easier to just mess around with them until you stumble upon the solution by accident. Pfft, at least they let you do that. Okay, so clearly this isn't an immersive sim like I thought it was, and judging it by those standards would be pretty unfair, so is it just a classic FPS? I'm not calling them boomer shooters. No. Well, I suppose, after all, there are piles and piles of enemies for you to fight, probably too many in fact. The game does have both a health and armor system a la Doom, and despite the game taking place in three separate hub worlds with their interconnected branching paths, the game is essentially level-based, it's just that all levels exist in the same physical space with the occasional shortcut that connects them together. Much of the core of the game is also about finding keys to open doors that allow you to proceed with a given area, while certain events and triggers summon hordes of enemies seemingly out of nowhere for you to fight two hallmarks of the classic FPS genre. However, the game is also far slower paced than your typical classic FPS, and the game wants you to take your time exploring and playing smart, using your environment to your advantage, as well as the unique abilities of your arsenal, as well as the various power crystals you can use to augment your priestly staff, but as I said before, the game is careful not to let you step too far off the path that the developers clearly laid down for you, meaning that more often than not, going in guns a is the most effective method of progression. Because of this, Graven finds itself in a sort of no man land between the two subgenres of the immersive sim and the classic FPS, bringing over many of the downsides of each without hardly any of the highlights of either. The game doesn't allow for open-ended creative play like an immersive sim, but brings over the slower paced methodical progression and resource management, as well as tools and abilities that ultimately go unutilized due to the lack of opportunities to use them in creative ways, and it has the hordes of enemies and the more linear progression of a classic FPS, but the limited resources prevent you from running around and shooting up the place like Mad, forcing you to spend way too much time backtracking to collect more ammo and supplies. Taking all this into consideration, it now makes perfect sense why this game has been getting such mixed reviews. Add in a really rough launch that brought the game out of early access with a whole host of bugs and balancing issues, and it's clear that Graven could have used a bit more time in the oven. Uh, not to mention that one of the patches the developer released about a week after the game's launch completely broke the game's drop system so that no gold or ammo would drop from enemies or the environment like they used to, so you had to spend all of the gold 
gold you found in chests on ammo just to proceed, which prevented you from using that gold to upgrade your weapons, and it was almost a week before they fixed this, so players like me, who were halfway through the game at the time, just kinda had to sit around with our thumbs up our asses or struggle through and accept that we were locked out of upgrading our gear when the developer could've just rolled back the patch at any time. Yeah, I somehow managed to beat the game while I was in this state, and it sucked. The game also has some really strange design choices at its core as well. One of these is a lack of a proper save system, with the game only having a smattering of checkpoints throughout its world, with your only method of manually saving being to quit the game entirely, and when you do, you'll get a message that says that all of your progress will be saved. And this right here is misleading as hell, because all that Graven is actually saving are items you picked up, as well as any shortcuts you've unlocked, because when you start the game the next time, you'll always find yourself back at the hub, with you having to backtrack through areas you've already been been through just to get back to where you are when you quit. In theory, this would be fine due to the aforementioned shortcuts, but these are few and far between, and almost all of them require going through practically a whole level section, some of which are quite large and can take well over an hour to complete before you unlock them, meaning that you have to commit yourself to finishing an area you're in before you quit playing, or you'll have to do it all over again. This also would be fine if it weren't for the fact that enemies respawn in certain areas when you quit the game, so unless you've gone through a whole area and done everything you wanted to do prior to leaving, you're going to have to do it all over again. Or maybe not, as each chapter and segment of the game seems to handle this differently. In my experience, two large sections of chapter one will respawn every enemy if you quit the game, while another large area only respawns a handful of enemies. However, in chapter two, enemies don't seem to respawn at all, while in chapter three, you don't even need to quit the game for them to respawn, as they just pop back up if you happen to walk too far away from where you killed them. I asked around in the Steam discussion forum for this game, trying to get to the bottom of this, and one player said that this was indeed the case, while another said that in his game, enemies respawned in chapter two, while in my game, they didn't, while one of the developers for the game said that enemies don't respawn at all and that I don't know what I'm talking about, but then plenty of other players mentioned that no, they do in fact respawn when you quit the game and that it seems to be completely random and different for every player, so I have no idea and I'm starting to think this is just another glitch aspect of the game. And that's kind of the vibe I walked away from Graven with, that it's just not done and it left early access far too soon and I think that's a bit of a shame because even though I spent a good chunk of this critique shitting on the game, I still think there's a worthwhile experience here, it's just not ready for prime time yet. So, no, this isn't an immersive sim, it's just a very slow-paced classic FPS with some unique level design that loops back onto itself in creative ways, and if it weren't for all the glitches and balancing issues and the fact that the developer completely broke the game while I was halfway through it, I think I would have really enjoyed it, and actually, at times, I did really enjoy it. There were moments throughout my playthrough where it all just started to fit together, and I found myself running around shooting enemies and using my abilities to figure out how to proceed and having a blast while doing so. There were times when I would have to think creatively in order to proceed, like dropping down from a balcony and backing up into a window in order to reach the second floor of a mansion that was locked off to me, something that felt very reminiscent of the think-outside-of-the-box design methodology of Hexen and Hexen 2. Occasionally, I would find myself with a surplus of ammo while facing a massive horde of enemies and could just run around shooting up the place like in Doom or Quake while mixing up my weapons, magic, and using the environment to my advantage like in Dark Messiah or Deus Ex, and I would find my heart beginning to race with glee. I would find secrets and solve puzzles using knowledge I had attained from notes and hints from characters in town and would feel like a smarty pants for figuring it all out, while on several occasions I felt my jaw drop as I admired just how intricately and carefully crafted some of the level design of Graven actually is. I can't help but feel that deep down there's a really great game here, one that's even worthy of calling itself a spiritual successor to the Heretic slash Hexen games, but you've really gotta squint to see it in that favorable light. There's a really unique little game here at its core, and I think it's one I'm going to enjoy much more in the future once all the kinks have been worked out, if they're worked out, so I think I'm just going to leave it at that for now. Graven is very rough around the edges, and despite being out of early access for a few weeks now, is still far from being finished, so unless you're really itching to play a medieval-themed classic FPS right now and have a high tolerance for unpolished, rough-around-the-edges games, I'd wait for at least another year of patches before checking it out to see if Slipgate Ironworks can manage to salvage the project. And I hope they do, because at its core, Graven is a really neat little game that brings a lot of interesting ideas, both old and new, to the table, while its level design, theming, and aesthetics are top-notch. It is just a shame that everything else about the game sucks. I'm Noah Lee, god of game criticism, and thus have I spoken.